Daniel, you're Swiss. Why fashion and not pharmaceuticals or finance? <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, that started, or I guess, started already when I was small, uh, little. Uh, as my second name is Greeter, and it's a true story. Everywhere I go, they always said, "Ah, oh, you are Daniel Greeter. You you are uh, the, the Greeter from the fashion uh, uh, store." I said, "No, that's not me." <laughs> but everywhere, a lot of disappointed ladies. Yeah, yeah, yeah can be. Can be. Uh, so uh, somehow that triggered me uh, to the, I know, let's look into the fashion industry when I was little. And I looked at the store and somehow I got related to, to the fashion industry. Um, I made also, uh, my sister uh, went, had a, had a husband today and he was also in the fashion industry. And then I made um, my, you know, my, my education. I did uh, the KV, the BMS, and I went to Globus. And I did my uh, whole education at the Globus. And, and somehow that's, that's what is related, but it's my second name. And it's still today, wherever I go, they say, ah, you're Daniel Greeter, you are the family from, from the store. I said, no, that's not me, but I'm also in the fashion industry. So now they get used to it. But uh, that's how I think where the first time I started was really because of that name. But really, you're more entrepreneur as opposed to whatever the end product is. Yeah, I mean, um, I started, you know, after what was that, 1986, when I had finished all my schools, I just started my own company, and uh, I I was so driven by the fashion industry uh, that I started my first company <laughs> in the in the fashion industry, and I was selling at that time. I was selling leather out of Turkey to anybody. That's about my, my first business. And then uh, um, how do you say, fashion jewelry. Um, it always, uh, you know, I, I, I never switched or I never thought about I should go into real estate or I should go into banking or <laughs> pharmacy. Never thought about that. I was addicted to the fashion industry. And fashion and clothes, has that always been important to you when you just personally dressing? To be honest, not that much. Because um, when, you, when you see me uh, today and you saw me when I was uh, even before 20, I still wear the same styles. I always have my jeans, I have my polo, and my uh, navy and my sneakers. And uh, today I, I basically wear a suit with uh, a, a blue suit with a white or a light blue shirt. So it's very similar. I'm not, when you see me or people would never say, oh, he's very fashionable. No, I'm, I'm not that fashionable, but I'm sophisticated dressed. That's, that's what I'm looking for. And the word Swiss and fashion, are they two words that typically go together in you, a sense? You think it doesn't work together, <laughs> right? Uh, Tell me if I'm wrong. <laughs> well, I, th I think it doesn't matter uh, where you come from, uh, you know, what you do. It's, it's something that is in your head and, and it's my passion. It's, uh, it's, it's not only the fashion is my passion, it's the business. It's the entrepreneurial spirit that I got in those days that drives me. And uh, I think it's, you know, if you come from the States or from England or from France or from Switzerland or from Austria, it's, it's what you as a person, what you want and what you dream of. And I started in the fashion and I continue to be in the fashion. And what's changed, would you say, since the mid 80s to now? What are the biggest changes in the fashion industry? I think there's one big change and that's speed. I remember when something was fashionable at that time, it was for two years, the fashion. So you had the white socks. <laughs> at that time, it stayed for two years. Today, the fashion is much faster. It's, it's, it's changing every month, actually every week. Uh, so the end consumer is, is, uh, you know, is changing his uh, fashion, he's changing the style uh, in a much regular way. Um, in, in a much regular way and uh, it's you know there's more opportunity so at that time you had you had a collection that was more or less you could go for years similar collection today you have to change your collection but how do you keep up Daniel uh, it's a mindset it's a mindset that uh, you have to get up in the morning and you have to think everything what was good yesterday might be not good enough for tomorrow and that's what is driving our company. That's driving uh, uh, us uh, to always try to get better tomorrow and never stand still. Always continue to, to go, to, to find ways to, to, be, to be innovative what the next thing can be. Maybe you can give me an example of one of those innovations. Um, I think today there is oh, there's so much innovation happening in product, but also in technology. 
uh, in businesses. And I think you always have to be to keep up. Today we talk about digitalization. It's 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 you know it's this is one part. You have to be you have to get there. You cannot ignore it and say ah, digital is for the young generation. It's our end consumer. Our end consumer is from young to old, and you have to trigger all of them. And um, so that's one in digitalization. But also, if you go to product, today product needs to be much more sustainable. Um, uh, end consumers wants to know where it is produced, what exactly it is out from. They just not, you know, go here and buy. They want to know what they buy. So You're talking about yeah, two key areas I'd like to just uh, delve a bit deeper. First of all, um, in terms of the digitalization. Now, how are you reaching that end consumer today? via the digital means, social media, apps, what are you doing? Yeah, <laughs> I think we do a whole palette of, of, uh, innov of projects that we are looking. When you, when you see that store, I think there's three key elements uh, you see. One is, um, okay, we go now in retail, but I'm, I'm just making an example what's happening in retail, I, I believe in. So first of all, it's traditional retail. Customers wants to come in here, they want to uh, try on the new collection, you know. Like that's still relevant. That's re still absolutely relevant. We call it one third is still the old way. The second one is the digitalization. So you see the shoppable walls, you, you see the endless eyes, you go into the changing room and you can have all, uh, you know, you can uh, beam it to the social media. You can ask your friends if they like your, your dress you're wearing. This is everything embedded in this, we call it store of the future. And then the third one is this uh, nice place there, that's people's place, where it is more social, uh, where you socialize, where you can hang out, where you can work, where you can be, where you feel comfortable. So that's the three elements. You have to build, a, a cons you have to, it's about experience you have in the store. It's about, you want to come here, not just to buy, you want to come here because you want to be in that store. Maybe you meet your friends here. Uh, maybe you want to meet them here and you want to just have a drink. Maybe you just want to dump your husband there. Yeah, the, exactly. The, the second point you mentioned, the shoppable wall. Tell yeah. me more about that, what's that? Well, um, I believe that in the future, uh, the retail space is getting smaller. As you know, it's very expensive. We are here at the Bahnhofstrasse. It's uh, super expensive. And I think the trend is not anymore in these big flagship stores, you know, where you get lost. It's about, you know, having like more the feeling of uh, integrated and, and, and overseeable. And in the smaller stores, you don't have uh, the possibility to have the full collection uh, presented. So I believe when you have a shoppable wall, uh, it's basically the online shop. So on the online shop, you have a lot more opportunities to show the whole collection. So you can, what you see here in the shop, when you go into that shop of a wall, the collection you can see and you can buy is much bigger. You cannot immediately get it here, but within 24 hours, you can either collect it here in the store or we send it to your home. So I here in Zurich could shop for something in your Asia collection or your yes. US collection. Yes. Tell me about those consumer tastes and how they vary between the states, Europe and Asia. Yeah, um, well, I would say um, that the, the main difference between Europe, the Europe together with Asia versus the US, uh, Europe and Asia are much more quality driven and consumers and the US is much more price driven and that's what you have to adapt your collection to a more price driven uh, end consumer versus a quality driven end consumers and uh, when you see the collection they look similar but in the US it's a bit uh, um, you know less materials that are expensive or more expensive but in Europe and in Asia you can actually go one step further in terms of quality. But just generally could you say how tastes are changing for example I had a friend that moved back to the States from Switzerland she said she loves to visit Switzerland because everyone seems so dressed up um, on the Bahnhofstrasse versus say LA where everyone's casual and wearing their fitness clothes. Yeah. Um, yeah, it is. It is more sophistication in, in everything that I think in Europe, in the States, it's about more, yeah, it's, <laughs> okay, when you go to New York, when you go to Los Angeles, when you go to this, uh, the big cities, I think it's maybe even similar to what it is in Europe and in Asia, but when you go outside, which is huge, it, you know, you see the difference. And uh, 
you know, the European loves it a bit more fitted, <laughs> and in the US they like it a bit more big, <laughs> more comfortable. Do you think the Swiss are very interested in fashion? They like to look well and to follow the latest trends, or is it more about the classics? I think, uh, yes, you have both. I think you have the young generation who is much more interested into fashion. And I would see when I look around uh, how the young kids are dressed, also in Zurich, I don't see a big difference between Los Angeles, Paris, uh, uh, London and Asia. I think the young generation is much more, is much more similar to what we used to be in the past. You mentioned the rents, the high rents on Bahnhofstrasse. Will we ever see a store like this reduced to a very small space or even a ghost town on Bahnhofstrasse? Yeah, I think uh, you know the, 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 the retail world is changing. You, he you heard about pop-up stores. I believe in pop-up stores. You know, something new uh, um, that can be small. It can be for one month, it can be for a year. Um, it can be at the, at the, um, it can be at the station. It can be at the, at the, anywhere in this world, and with these shoppable walls, um, we actually can put them anywhere, and you can buy immediately from those walls. So we can put it at the, at the airport. Do you consider yourself a leader in the fashion industry? Um, you, you mean Tommy Hilfiger? Both, I would you say <laughs> and Tommy Hilfiger. I, I think we are quite advanced and, and I must say that in various areas, first of all, in the, in, in, I think in speed, in innovation and digitalization, we are quite advanced. But let me also um, summarize why I believe. So we have a clear vision. Uh, we have a clear vision, we have a mission and we have a purpose of the brand. That is clearly defined in our company and everybody in our company uh, from uh, knows that vision and in that vision there are three pillars one is uh, um, uh, being consumer centric so in the past it was all about the boutiques and what the customers from the boutique what they buy today it's all about the end consumer so that's one pillar the second one is adapt to change because as you know and as you see the world is changing so fast and we need as a company as a big company we have to adapt to those to those, to those uh, changes in the world. And the third pillar we have is it's all about product. Product is king. Uh, you can have the best name uh, if your product, uh, that's not only in our industry, it's car industry, pharmacy industry, everywhere. If the product isn't good enough, you will not be, you will not be successful in the future. So that's the three pillars we have based on our values, how we do business. You revolutionized the catwalk. You had this yes. see now, buy now idea. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah, that is, 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 uh, that was amazing. And that was, <laughs> so basically today, what you see on the catwalk, in the past, you had to wait a season of six months until you were able to buy. We revolutionized this, that whatever you see on the catwalk, you can buy immediately. Uh, at that time, so uh, on online, but also in the in the flagship in all the flagship store around the world. This is a massive transformation of and the have business. Have competitors followed you in this? Yes, they did, but uh, uh, they already. Uh, it's so complex in terms of operation of supply chain to make that happen and. Uh, most of them actually already stepped out because it is very complex. So how do you keep up with that demand and that complexity? I think uh, it's, it's, uh, it's the team. I have a, I'm, I'm so lucky that I have a very strong team ab around me. And we have in our company, we have a, a, you know, a mission that it's called make the impossible possible. And we were sitting together and said, how can we make it happen? Because it, you know, already some started and they stopped. And I said, look, we, we have to make it happen. And actually, when you see that today, we are faster than a Zara or an H&M because normally they went to these fashion shows, they copied, and they were very fast in copying. Within six weeks, they produced it and then had it in the store. So today, we are even faster because whatever they see on, on the stage, we immediately have How in the How do you stores. keep up the level of motivation across the supply chain? How do you use digitalization across the world? Because I assume the production happens everywhere. Yeah, uh, well, that's the, the adapt to change. That's the flexibility you need to keep up. And that's the technology what we have with the digital showroom. It's something uh, that, that started out of nothing. And it's actually funny. So you are from you know, TV. Actually, the idea I had from the, the weather broadcast. So they- It hasn't changed much in the last uh, 
few decades, I guess. <laughs> like this? Well, I was watching TV and then I saw, you know, a guy explaining how the cloud is going from west to east and, and the weather and the sun and all that, but all digital. I said, wow, would that be wonderful if we can talk about our collection digitally? And I started to, to, to tell that to the people and they said, Daniel, it never works in the fashion industry. You have to, you have to feel it. So we just do now swatches so they still can feel it, but we can, sell, uh, we can show everything digital, which is making everything much more faster. So that's one reason why we have in that supply chain. So you chain. use that to communicate with yes. your producers. And, and, and actually, we go, you know, this is only one part, uh, but it, it, makes, it speeds up everything. You don't have to do these samples, these massive samples. You don't have to fly them in, so it's more sustainable. So it's cost reduction, space reduction, time reduction, and sustainability. Now we go even a step further, which is not happening in the industry. We go into digital design. So what you can actually expect from us in the, in the coming months is we design digitally. From the di digital design, we can do holograms and you can see it, you know, you're, 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 you can see on a hologram how it fits and, and then you have a swatch, you can feel it. So we do it, uh, design it digitally and then we put it into the digital showroom. That means we sell it also digitally and from there it goes direct to the vendors. So they can produce direct from the digital showroom, they get all the information, the data and produce immediately. So with that, the whole supply chain a, a chain is reducing by minimum half. So we can get, again, speed. It's all about being consum consumer centric because you, as an end consumer, what you see, what you hear, you want to buy tomorrow. And that's what we can offer with our brand. And tell me about the supply chain and, and the fabrics and how that's changing because sustainability is a big yes. thing now and yes. customers want to know where their cotton has been farmed, Absolutely. for example. Yes. Um, especially the new generation and I think that's that's good you know today it's not a question anymore if you want to get uh, if you want to make the, the world better we all have to help to make to make a, a better world so we are gonna have a more sustainable cotton uh, we do much uh, less we use uh, less water uh, for our denims for example uh, we everything we try to do, we put sustainability in every part of, <clears throat> of the product, just to give the customer another reason to buy Tommy. Do so you feel a huge pressure in that regard? Uh, a pressure? I think it's an opportunity. I think I, I don't see it. I, I see it as a must do, um, as everybody should do that because the world has to get more sustainable. And we in the in the fashion industry. Too many things happened. Uh, nobody said something. The water we used, um, you know, has to. We have to be a better Just world. Just walk me through how much water you would need, say, for a pair of jeans. Oh, uh, for a pair of jeans you, in the past, you used uh, uh, maybe over a hundred liters of water. Today, with the new technology, you maybe use seven liters of water. But this is a massive, uh, this is transformation. In, in, but you can do that because there is a new technology, laser uh, washing, you know, and, and this, is, this, this is only Will one example. Will jeans always be part of our wardrobe? I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. It's still my favorite part. And, and I think uh, it, is, it was so many years and I think it continues to be uh, every year. Every look around, it's just today they wear it with a lot of holes in it. And, uh, you know, you think, oh my God, this, <laughs> they're crazy, right? They're, you should throw them away. No, you actually make it like that. It's a trend. And I think the denim is interesting to see. They went through so many trends over the past. In, term, in terms of trends and classics and vintage, how, how do these all play a role now in Tommy Hilfiger? Um, okay, we, we are, you know, we have a long history of our company and, and we have icons, uh, you know, many things we can do and we have a, re a revival, the 90s are back, uh, so things are coming back, for, you know, the, the, the logos and, and all that, but you always have to be in the right balance. I think you have to be, you have to bring um, icons back, you have to go into the past and see and, and tell the stories, but you always have to modernize it. So you cannot just bring an old item and say this is uh, hip again. You always have to put the twist to it. You always have to, that's what we do. We always try to make it better. We always try to make it more modern, newer. And uh, we give the customer, the end consumer, a reason to buy it again. Maybe that's the shape, the quality, whatever it is. Maybe you can talk about profitability and the parent company, PVH, how that supports you or not in terms of growing. 
Oh, uh, since we are, as you know, we were taken over by PVH, um, what is that now, six years ago, um, things have uh, actually been better because they continue also to invest in our brand. And you know, you have to invest into everything. You cannot just invest into marketing. You have to invest into marketing, that's true. But in digitalization, in product, in servicing, in retail, there's so many areas you, you cannot just as a brand stop and lean back and say, oh, it's working. You have to continue to find something new, a, a, a point of difference, um, a, a new reason. Today, it's in the retail, it's not only about turnover per square meter, it's about engagement per square meter, it's about newness per square meter, it's about uh, happiness per square meter. And that's what we in the fashion industry need to do. And Tommy Hilfiger is still very much part of the company and very um, active in design with some of your global ambassadors. How important are these ambassadors that you have? Oh, um, I think, uh, you know, when you, uh, first of all, yes, Tommy is still in the business. He is a genius and we use him as a consultant. We show him the collection and he gives his input and, um, uh, you know, and... Why uh, is he a genius? So, uh, Why do you believe he's a genius? Because he always, he, he goes through the, the product and he finds exactly a point that you say, ah, yes, he's right, that you could have improved or that you should do better. He, he sees it, he's amazing. He, it's like when you have a bookkeeper, he looks into the figures and he sp spots one figure that is wrong. Uh, Tommy can do that on, on close, so, and, and he does it in a very nice way. So now, um, we, with our celebrities we use, so think about what we have done with Gigi Hadid. We had her two and a half years ago, we started with her. She was a nobody. And within two and a half years, she's now a star. And we made that in collaboration with her. You know, she, she, we did the collection with her. Uh, we got a new uh, end consumer, a, a younger end consumer. And that's how we make it. So today she has her own collection, uh, which we helped her to be. She is a she is a supermodel, and and so that really worked. But now out. you use a, um, someone who's known, Lewis Hamilton. Yeah. So, so that's, he, that's he doesn't awesome. need help, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Actually, he came. To, it was his idea. He came to us and he said, Daniel, can you do something similar? What you have done with Gigi? Can you do that with me? And I thought okay, that might be actually a good idea. So I discussed with the team and what we, you know, we were really pushing over the past two and a half years, the women's wear business. And now we want to do a similar way, uh, always with a new twist. We want to do that with men's wear. And Louis is a perfect ambassador. He has the same values as we are. He has the same drive. And I think he just is the right person for the next, for the, a new uh, generation that helps us to get a new end consumer. And you know, we, we, he's known, that's true, but he never expected that he is gonna be in the fashion industry. And uh, you know, he, he asked me, can you, can, can you help me to get into the fashion industry? Maybe uh, when I stop racing, maybe I can do once my own brand. Like Chi Chi has now her own brand, uh, you know, she, he can also have his own uh, brand. And I thought, that's a wonderful idea, let's try. Do you still need traditional marketing these days or can you do away with it? Well, I think, uh, you, you know, it's like the store, uh, uh, one third is still traditional. I think also um, a part of uh, marketing should always be still traditional because nothing is only changing into, into the digital area or online or social media. There is still some magazines where you have to put some papers. There's still billboards that go up. So I think you always have to find the right balance and, and you should not go from one extreme to the other. You should always innovate. You should always go a step further, but you should never completely forget the tail end. You, you have to shift all into in, uh, forward and to the, the, ne the next level, but you cannot forget about the rest immediately, step by step, inch by inch. Daniel, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Van. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Mm -hmm.